Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for being patient while we waited for the other group to come in. We heard from so many of our speakers yesterday about timely completions and stuff. And so I also have completed my PhD in the spring of, I think, 2026 or something. So um, nearly there, <laughs> nearly there. A glorious start to the day. Sunshine, sand, smiles, students learning to surf. Arms waving and looks of triumph, asking without words, Sir, did you see me? I wave back. I saw you, you were great. To the figure standing out in the waves. A glorious start to the day. Back to the mundane, the classroom. We bring the smiles, the smell of salt, and a few stray grains of sand clinging to toes, now properly covered by school shoes, with us. Hearts are full and bodies refreshed, eager to soak in learning like the rays of the morning sun. Equations, questions, jokes, music, answers, solutions, pens, laptops and laughter. An excellent lesson while we prepare for exams. Confidence rises. Glorious middle to the day. An out of place look between classes. Hey, before you go in, how are you? Oh, I'm okay. The eyes speak the truth while the lips lie. No, oh, really? What's up? Are you worried about your exam? Because you've been preparing really, really well. The story starts in a very familiar place. Stress, anxiety, big emotions, responsibility, study. The story is brief and it's ever so innocent. It's really casual. It's always been hard to be a teenager, but I think it's getting harder than it was. Ah, there it is. The faint but clear whisper of no hope in sight. The smoke and mists of musings, finding solid form in a plan. Calm. Procedure. Smiles, reassurance. Escort to the nurse's office. Psychologist, risk assessment, emergency department. Safe and the best place to receive care. Where are my whiteboard markers again? One last class before home. Equations, questions, jokes, music, answers, solutions, pens, laptops and laughter. An empty chair that's somehow louder than all the rest. A not so glorious end of the day. Home for dinner, marking, planning, scotch and sleep. I wonder if tomorrow I'll have a glorious start to the day. <laughs> Sorry for getting choked up there. Um, that's a poem and I'm not a poet but that's a reflection that I wrote um, about three weeks ago after a day that I'd had with my year 12 students and my journey so far in my study and in my research is really about helping teachers with this emotion that I'm feeling right now and if you've ever cared from someone who's been hurt or if you've ever been an educator of young people and connected because we all know that the best teaching and learning happens when there is a genuine connection between the educator and the student. If you've ever been connected to young people that are hurting, you can't help but be hurt by their pain. And that's what brings me to my research. Where I'm up to at the moment is characterised, I think, by this photo. Um, this is one that I did take. I didn't take the photo of the beach that you saw a second ago. This is a little secret spot up in the hinterland. And why I keep going back to this photo is, and you might see my son and I are swimming at the bottom of a waterfall there. Um, being a secret spot, it's really difficult to actually get there. It was about 45 minutes off the track. We probably definitely shouldn't have been going there. Um, but once you get there, it's actually really, really worth it. It's worth the journey. It's worth the prickles. It's worth the sharp rocks in your feet. It's worth the journey to actually get there. And the phase that I'm in, in my research, I feel like it's a tough journey at the moment, but I'm keeping in mind that it's going to be worth it when I get there. This up on the screen is my working title. Um, but before I continue, I would like to acknowledge the Yugambeh people, and particularly the Kumaberi people of the Yugambeh language group on 
which land we are meeting today, where I work and where I learn and where I'm raising my kids. And I honour the elders past, current and emerging. I think particularly in the Faculty of Education, when we are working for a better tomorrow for our kids than what our yesterday was, we actually do honour those elders and we do honour the traditions of the First Nations people of Australia where they continually would pursue learning for the benefit of their children so that their tomorrows might be brighter than the yesterdays were. But I'm looking at or hoping to understand Queensland teachers' experiences of vicarious trauma in a digitally saturated world. Oh, that's just a quote that I really liked, but I'm going to skip past that. Um, how did I get here? Well, I've gotten here by collecting a few stones along the way. I've gone through and I've, through life, through experience as a teacher, I've been a high school teacher for about 15 years. There's a number of colleagues that I see who are wonderful educators that just become tired and then become worn out and then leave. And it's such a loss, not only to their students, but it's a loss to our profession as a whole when we lose great teachers, when they get burnt out, when these teachers that care so profoundly and so deeply about their students and about the success of their students walk away. And one conversation that I had a couple of years ago, right at the beginning of my journey into this research, was with a colleague who had left the classroom um, the year before. And just catching up with him and, hey, Pete, how are you going? What are you doing? And we were just having those little pleasantries and, oh, I've started studying. I'm looking at this idea of vicarious trauma. And in a short conversation that we had, and if you're an educator, you've seen this many times before, his eyes just had that moment of, oh, that's what it is, understanding. And that's that look in the students that we continue going back to the classrooms for. But he'd said that the reason he left the classroom, he he couldn't name it until we'd had that conversation, but he said that's exactly what it was. I just was so emotionally tired of supporting these kids with all these horrible things that were happening to them outside the classroom, outside our control, and bringing it with them. I couldn't keep hurting for them. And he didn't have the language until we'd had that conversation. So I'm wanting to understand that. I've collected a few stones. Um, we live in a digitally saturated world. Digital technology is not going away. We've had some fantastic presentations over the last couple of days about the influence that digital technology can have on our lives. It's amazing. It's here. We're in a digitally saturated world. We have, I think, an incredibly important movement in researching the field of education about the digital, not sorry, digital, about the trauma-informed classroom. I think as educators we do need to get better informed about the impacts of trauma on the lives of our students. And I also think that even though my research is going in a slightly different direction, that we should be prioritising the wellbeing of our students. We are the grown-ups. We can't be forgotten, but I think the students do need to come first. So I'm, I'm certainly not saying that we shouldn't be travelling in this, direc this direction. Um, vicarious trauma first emerged as an idea in the legal profession. We we're actually seeing some symptoms similar to someone who would be presenting with um, post-traumatic stress disorder in legal professors who were teaching about violent crime and about assault and about horrific things semester in, semester out, and dwelling on these awful things that had never happened to them, but they were starting to exhibit the symptoms of PTSD. And that's where the idea of vicarious trauma came from, that the trauma that you are exposed to that someone else has experienced can actually affect you. Um, in the latest edition of the DSM, which came out in 2013, which is um, our diagnostic tool for mental health, it was finally recognised as a thing that people can experience and it can be diagnosed. Um, interestingly, for the world that we live in at the moment and for my research, it specifically does say that vicarious trauma cannot come through digital technology. It must be a personal connection. Um, I'm expecting that to change in the next edition, but I don't have a crystal ball. I could be wrong. And also just the alarming attrition rates of teachers. Um, we don't have enough teachers as it is. COVID has seen to that and we're in a profession where everyone's already stretched, everyone's already exhausted, everyone's already right at their limit and right at their capacity and then 
we're still being asked to do more and more and more and more as educators. And this is the ground where I think that creates perfect soil for vicarious trauma to grow. And then, of course, we have the weight of the stones that I didn't choose to carry, these burdens that I carry from students over my career that have said things, made comments and experienced things that are just horrific that I still carry. Um, even my very first experience as an educator um, asking for some advice from my head of department um, about a student who had been caught cheating was, oh, excellent, he doesn't like you. Next time he plays up, turn around so no one else in the classroom can hear call his mum and the head of department at the time was very clear about what specific term to use about this student's mum. Call his mum this. He's real sensitive about his mum. He'll punch you and we can expel him. That was the advice from my very first head of department. Uh, I didn't follow that advice and we actually had a win with that student. But anyway, it was pretty good. Um, I've carried some stones and I found a pond. My pond is Queensland secondary staff. There is some research about vicarious trauma in the support staff in schools and in the counsellors in schools, but as yet there is no research that I've been able to find about teaching staff, um, particularly in Australia, um, but I've not yet found any research about vicarious trauma for teachers. A pond in the forest is no good unless it's got some shade. The shade that my pond is living under is Bronfen Brenner's theory of um, bioecological systems theory of how people interact and connect with each other. Bakker and Demarudi's job demands resource model. Can I do my job with the resources that I have or is that unbalanced and am I going to burn out? And Abiel's theory of digital well-being as a dynamic construct. Sometimes the digital technologies that we rely so heavily on for our lives can support our well-being. Sometimes it can be the platform that we are abused through. So the idea of well-being in a digital space is actually quite dynamic and difficult to pin down. And it's not like the idea once was where if you spend four hours a day, then you'll have this really bad effect. It's not just the time that we spend with digital technology. It's more complex than that. What I'm going to do with those stones, I was actually going to chuck them on the pond and I'm going to skip those stones and see what the ripples do, see how they dance and see how the light changes and see how they interact with each other. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to look at those things pragmatically. I think um, it's really important to ask the right question when we're doing research and let our methods be directed by that question. If we're researching and trying to find something and using an incorrect method, we'll find the wrong answer. Um, I'm going to use a mixed methods approach, particularly an explanatory sequential mixed methods design to ask a couple of questions, which I think are going to come up on my next slide. Yes, I am organised. Yay. So my research questions for this is to begin with, I'm going to do a questionnaire using the validated um, vicarious trauma scale, which has been used in a number of different places. The vicarious trauma scale is a relatively short questionnaire. So I'm going to add to that some demographic information as well. Um, but with the approximately 32,000 uh, secondary teachers in Queensland, I'm going to need to hopefully get about 380 responses to have a st significant um, study for that. I'm hoping to keep my questionnaire small so I actually do get people to respond to it. It would be really great. That is going to be used to answer the question, to what extent do teachers experience vicarious trauma? I will also use the demographic information from that questionnaire to ascertain are there some particular groups of teachers that are greater or lesser risk. I am very careful using the word risk. Um, conversation with Emma about that word risk. As soon as we use the word risk, it actually also has legal ramifications as well. And because if there's risk involved, then there's liability and then we can sue our employers. So I'm, I am going to be very careful about how I use that word. Thank you. Then phase two, which will be a qualitative study, I'm going to narrow right down and look at hopefully 10 participants for some semi-structured interviews where I will find out hopefully what do teachers say about their experiences of vicarious trauma? I'm going to dive into hopefully through a narrative inquiry-inspired approach to these interviews. 
And also in response to these experiences, what are teachers' perspectives on the implications to the profession? What can we actually do about this? It's not enough to just ask the question, hey, are you feeling terrible or what are your experiences? But we actually need to be able to move forward. And particularly speaking about wellbeing, I think it's very, very important to listen to the stories of teachers that it's not enough to just do a quant study here. The quant study will be helpful to know how wide this problem is, but to actually understand it, we need people's stories. And I actually want to hear about the experiences of people. Yeah, so that's how I'm going to be skipping the stones. There's a couple of things of some resources that I've looked at and some sources that I've found very helpful. I am still very early in my journey so please, if don't be frustrated with me if I don't have answers to your questions yet, but please ask them anyway because it's going to shape my next direction of thinking. But uh, thank you for being patient for listening. Thank you. Questions and comments? I'll have to run around. Oh, you're going to use it. Okay, great. <laughs> hey, um, thank you. That was just awesome. And Jesus, you are a poet. That was incredible. <laughs> that was like, wow. Thank you. That was, that was patient. Thank you. Um, so I was just wondering about maybe if you've considered having a, some sort of clinical supervision for yourself doing the research, because you're going to come up with a lot of trauma again, like what's secondary vicarious trauma? Yes. No, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, it's something that I've definitely spoken with my supervisors about as well. And uh, approaching this research from an education background rather than a psychology background. I'm very, very aware of both my failing in terms of experience in this area and my limitations. Um, so not only am I definitely going to be pursuing self-care for, for me, um, but also I'm going to have to be very, very careful, particularly with those um, the semi-structured interviews, that I'm not accidentally communicating that I'm an expert in this area, that I'm wanting to listen to the stories but not able to provide healthcare. Um, I don't think it is an appropriate place for a teacher who doesn't have that experience to put themselves in the position of a counsellor. Um, and so that with my ethics process, that's going to be definitely quite a large consideration to not only protect um, my own wellbeing but the wellbeing of my participants as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would it be worthwhile when you're actually writing your research questions to prevent re-traumatising your participants? Have you thought a bit about that or how you might? I, it's very faint. I can't hear you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I just asked if you've thought as well about when what you said about when you're speaking to your participants about the possibility of re-traumatising them when you're asking them about those experiences. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the exclusion criteria that I will use is through that vicarious trauma scale um, it, it's very limited in that it can measure if there is vicarious trauma there. Um, it can't really tell me much more because it is only a very short questionnaire, that part of it. Um, I will be excluding people who have um, either recently sought medical or um, clinical intervention for their own um, health care and their own mental health. Um, I'll also be excluding people who are ranking at the extreme level on that scale as well, just because I'm I'm not the right person to be having that conversation with them to hopefully mitigate that continued harm and that re-traumatisation. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, question for Thank Megan. you for the question. I just want to say um, you, are, you are a wordsmith. I know that you are... Uh, your expertise, as you were telling me this morning, is in maths, but you have such a great handle of the English language and you, your poem was, like, so touching. I don't know if there was anyone else in here who wasn't tearing up at the end of that. I think we were all with you in that. And just the way that you write is just amazing. I've seen drafts of your work. It's it's going to be a very beautiful piece of work just like your wife's <laughs> just submitted PhD and I don't know I just wanted I'm just so proud and it's I'm just really looking forward to seeing how this is going to shape up. Oh, that's very kind thank you. <laughs> um, with, with that poem as well that's actually going to be a prelude to my methodology chapter. Um, I am going to include something similar 
Um, I haven't written them yet, but I'm going to see, include something similar to the as a prelude to each of my chapters through my thesis. And um, I think that's also what has drawn me to the idea of a narrative inquiry. So my particular methodology isn't a pure narrative inquiry. I can't do that as a mixed methods and because I'm using other, in, other influences. But I'm really, really driven by people's stories. And I think that once I'm done, and I know it's a massive mountain to get there, um, but once I'm done, I want to be able to have my research to help teachers. That's I'm, I'm not doing this for any other reason than to help the teachers who are exhausted out there because of this emotional fatigue. And the professional development that I've been a part of and been able to engage with as a teacher, it's always more powerful when it's a story that's told rather than here's the thing, do the activity, do the whatever, because you can carry a story with you, but you can't carry the, oh, I did that little activity and heard those three stats and stuff. Um, and maybe I think a little bit differently to someone and not everyone thinks the same as me, but, but stories are able to be carried. And I think being able to produce something that tells a story of, is powerful. I think that's important. Oh, thank you. I, I, don't, I hope you can hear me through this thing. Um, going back to kind of the methodology and data collection and you saying, you know, you're not the expert, you're not coming from, from the psychological point of view or a counsellor or anything like that, and I think you had up on there that you're hoping to interview 10 people. Have you considered actually having um, collecting that qualitative data in a written form? So actually providing a performer, a structure, some set mm. questions it might widen, I don't know if you need, you don't necessarily need more, but those people that you were saying, I'm going to exclude this person, I'm going to exclude this person, giving them the space and not actually having to speak face-to-face -face with someone about the mm. trauma but reflect on it and write about it, you you may still get really rich data. It depends what you're after, but I was just wondering if it was something you considered. Um, not yet, but, yeah, I'll definitely take that under advisement and I think that's really, really important. I, I am planning as part of my questionnaire to have um, an open-ended bit at the end to tell me about your experience. Um, so that will obviously be quite a large sample set, hopefully, if I get the 300 and something um, responses, to be a way of developing those questions that I do ask in the semi-structured interviews. Um, but, yeah, I think allowing respondents to respond to me in a way that they're comfortable with is really important, particularly when you're asking about something about trauma and about how they are doing in, in and of themselves. Um, that's really powerful and I'll definitely be, yeah, definitely be wanting to influence something like that. So thank you for mentioning it. Okay. I think we'll wrap up there. Thank you very much, Carl. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening.